Hi everyone. Oh. Hi everyone. Um, very warm welcome to our first seminar in the John Ryland's um, lunchtime seminar series. My name is Gaida Armstrong from the John Ryland's Research Institute and Library and um, the Italian department at the University of Manchester and I'll be chairing the session today. So in this series we're experimenting with a new remote presentation format which allows participants to view collection objects uh, live and participate in discussions. Um, you're joining us from the Map Room in the University of Manchester, and we also have remote outposts in my office and the John Ryland's Library in Deansgate as well. Um, our seminar today is on the Radford Collection, conserving and researching 19th century obstetrical and gynaecological images, and it'll be presented by Rebecca Whiteley and Elaine Sheldon. Before I introduce our speakers, uh, there's just a few housekeeping notices that I'd like to mention. So first of all, this event is being recorded and it'll be edited and made available on the John Ryland's Library YouTube channel. If you'd like to have subtitles, auto subtitles are available and you can do those using your own settings. We'll be using a Zoom webinar format. So this means that your camera and mic is disabled on entry. At the end of the session, there'll be some time for questions. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, please could you add your questions to the Q&A function at the bottom? These will then be selected by me as chair and I'll relay them to the panel. If you'd like to ask your question in person, um, if you, after you've submitted your question, if you could raise your hand, then I can call on you to ask it when we get to the Q&A. Um, we're hoping to get through as many questions as possible, but we will have to stop promptly at 1pm. If you'd also like to just make any further comments or uh, ask anything else as we go, um, you can use the general chat function and we'll be monitoring, monitoring both channels during the seminar. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to say something about the content as well. Um, we will be looking at 19th century obstetric and gynaecological illustrations, which means that there will be representations of fetuses and diseased body parts. So finally, um, as I said at the start, this is our new format uh, and we'd be very keen to get your feedback on it. So there'll be um, a short feedback survey which we'll send out at the end. Okay, so that was my preamble. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our two speakers. Dr. Rebecca Whiteley is the Shreve Fellow in the History of Medicine at the John Ryland's Research Institute and Library. She works at the intersection of art history, print culture and medical history. At present, she's researching the visual culture of midwifery education in 19th century Manchester, as well as articles published in Object, Social History of Medicine and British Art Studies. She has a book coming out with Chicago University Press later this year on early modern midwifery book illustrations called Birth Figures. And she's also publishing a chapter on the material that we'll be seeing today in an edited volume called Making Sense of Medicine, which is out later this year. And with Rebecca, we've got Elaine Sheldon, who's the senior conservator at the John Ryland's Research Institute and Library. OK, over to you two. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. We're really pleased to be bringing this amazing material to a wider audience and particularly being able to do it digitally and remotely. So Elaine and I have both come into contact with this material in different ways. Um, Elaine is a conservator and myself as a historian of art and medicine. Um, and today we're going to look at uh, four images from the collection um, that we hope represent this very large and diverse collection. Um, but we are happy to look at um, some more of the objects uh, after the talk if there's time in the questions. Um, we have the full boxes here. So I'm just gonna begin by giving you a little history of the collection, um, and then I will pass over to Elaine who will describe uh, how the work was conserved. Um, and, and I'll finish up by talking a little bit about my research um, into the collection and how its conservation has informed what I've been doing. So um, uh, these images were used to uh, teach obstetrics and midwifery to both male medical students and female midwives in the 19th century. Um, they were collected and in some cases produced by Dr. Thomas Radford, um, who was a well-known doctor and obstetrician in Manchester. Um, he taught at the Manchester and Salford Lying In Hospital, which was later named St. Mary's Hospital and is still going strong as a maternity hospital in Manchester today. Um, rising to the position of consulting physician, um, he denoted both his library uh, and his medical museum to the hospital in the 1850s. Um, and if we can look now at the start looking at the visualizer, we can start looking at the first object. So this should come up on your screen and this is actually the reverse of the first object we're going to look at. Um, and I've, I've pulled this in just so that you can see there's a little stamp on the back here. Um, and Elaine, maybe if I zoom in, 
and you can center there um, so people can see. Here we have a little um, stamp. So this is a hot stamp. It's kind of like a brand. I mean, it's burnt these letters into the paper and you can see also it's gone right through the paper. So we've lost the middle of the D. It says Dr. R for Dr. Thomas Radford. Um, so this is how we know that this was uh, originally from, you know, from his personal collections. And now if we flip it over, we can look at the front. <clears throat> we can see that this is the image that was painted on the sheet. So the 19th century in Manchester, um, oh, and in Britain as a whole, this was a time when women couldn't train as doctors. They could be nurses or midwives, um, but not all women in these professions received formal training. It was actually very difficult to receive formal medical training as a woman. Manchester is pretty special in this history because it offered formalized medical training for its midwives um, in the um, hospital from really early on, from the foundation in the 1790s. Um, it provided medical lectures for student midwives. Um, and it also um, employed professional midwives to attend poor women in the city. Uh, and these professional midwives, the ones who worked on the books for the hospital, were required to attend the uh, training lectures every single year to sort of keep up their skills. Um, and we actually know from some registers that are, are still in the archives here um, at the university library that many of them did attend every year. Um, so this collection of images belonged to the midwifery school. Um, and it was likely used to teach these midwives during their lectures, the student midwives and the professional midwives, um, and also to male medical students who would have come from the city's uh, hospitals and medical schools to learn specifically obstetrics and gynecology at the midwifery hospital. Um, and then can we move to the next object? So as I said, um, this, is, this was originally Dr. Radford's personal collection and he had a large library um, and a museum, uh, including things like uh, specimens, wet and dry specimens, and these images, which are what we now call the Radford collection. We'll zoom in a little bit. And I've just brought this one out to show you so that you can see that while uh, originally they were Dr. Radford's personal collection, and we can see that in his Dr. R. Hot brand, um, here we can also see the stamp of the, um, the, the school, St. Mary's Hospital, the Radford Library. So this is when he transferred his collections to the hospital in the 1850s. Um, and this stamp appears on many items uh, in the Radford collection and in the library as medical book collection. Um, by the late 19th century, the collection wasn't in active use anymore, um, but it was kept at St. Mary's Hospital until sometime in the 20th century um, when it was passed to the university library where it now resides. Um, the collection wasn't actually opened and examined properly until the early 2000s, and it wasn't catalogued until 2017. That this collection even exists today, let alone that it's available to examine, uh, is really just very exciting. Um, it's rare that such collections of loose leaf medical images survive. They were used to destruction or just sort of destroyed over time as they became less relevant um, and as hospitals stopped maintaining these museums. Um, but they were super common in the 19th century. Pretty much every medical school in the 19th century would have had such a collection of images. So it's amazing that we can study this one and we can really gain insights into uh, how these collect collections were organized and kept and what was in them. Um, I've been asking questions about what this collection can tell us about midwifery knowledge and about the experience of studying midwifery in the 19th century. I'm also looking at how medical images circulated in this period. Uh, many of the images in this teaching collection were originally book illustrations, um, including this one that you can see right now, um, that were either removed uh, from books and mounted separately or copied out of books. Um, other images in the collection are uh, drawings of prepared specimens. Um, so as a collection, they really show the way that visual knowledge could travel between media and between locations in the 19th century. But when I first started working with this material, it quickly became obvious that it was in quite a bad way and needed conservation. Um, so now I'll hand over to Elaine to tell you about that process. Um, can I have slide two? Back, thank you. Hello and welcome. In 2018, the Thomas Radford collection was prioritised for conservation work because of the poor condition it was in. My colleague Elizabeth Carr and I began a survey of the collection. Elizabeth is a paper conservator and the collection care manager at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library. 
Together, we looked at each object in the collection and recorded information such as the object size, the media used, the support type and the condition of the object. There are around 300 objects of various types in the collection, including hand-colored lithographs, printed on paper and mounted on a secondary card support, intaglio prints, large gouache paintings on paper, and oil paintings on card and canvas. Can I have the next slide, please, Jack? The collection was in a poor condition. The paintings, prints, and drawings were piled on top of each other in boxes. They were all extremely dirty. Many of the large paintings on paper were ripped and torn with crushed and crumpled edges. The objects appeared to have been extensively used and handled. Some of the objects showed signs of water damage, such as tide marks, and some had circular grey patches indicative of old and inactive mould. The next one, please. We discussed how to approach the conservation of the collection and how best to store the objects after conservation. Prints and drawings kept in galleries, museums and libraries are often window mounted with Japanese paper hinges in acid-free mounts of a standard size. These are then stored together in robust cloth covered boxes called cylinder boxes. Mounting objects in this way is time consuming. The objects need to be in a clean and conserved condition prior to mounting. And although the external size of the mount is often a standard size, each window needs to be measured and cut out to suit the individual object. We anticipated the project to conserve and mount the collection would take around two years to complete and be scheduled alongside other conservation projects and routine collection care work, such as surveying collections, preparing objects for exhibition and loan and preventive conservation. In 2018, shortly after the survey, we learned that Rebecca was arriving to study the Radford collection and that we had a matter of weeks to stabilize the objects and prepare the collection so that it was accessible. We needed to find an alternative or an interim solution and we needed to work quickly. At this time, paper conservator Janae Laudat joined the project. Have the next slide. The Radford collection is kept at the Archive and Records Centre here at the University of Manchester's main library, but our conservation lab is located at the John Ryland's Research Institute and Library, which is a short distance away on Deansgate. Transporting the collection would have been problematic because of the poor condition and fragility of the objects. The collection care department have use of a small workspace here at the main library and the first thing Janae and I did was to set this space up as a temporary lab, equipping it with everything we needed to work on the project. This included a cleaning table, museum back, portable extraction unit, chemical cupboard and a microscope, plus hand tools, adhesives and repair papers. Once the workspace was set up we began cleaning. We use soft brushes to gently brush the surface dirt off the objects and into a museum back. We also use smoke sponges to lift the dirt from the surface of the objects. We treated the areas of inactive mould with a solvent solution. Spot testing was carried out prior to treatment to check that the media was not soluble. This slide shows how dirty the collection was. On the right is the cleaning table and you can see how dirty the filter is. I've kept the filter because of the potential to analyze the dirt in the future. Could the material trapped in it reveal information about the environment in which the collection was used and kept? Next slide, please. We prioritized the repairs, concentrating our efforts where there was risk of further damage or where detached material was at risk of becoming lost. Many of the images are described in handwritten text on the back of the drawings or at the damaged corners and edges, making this information vulnerable to disassociation. And the next one. Finally, we came up with a system to rehouse the collection, which could be made quickly and cost effectively from stock materials and the, on the library's box making machine, which is the machine in the slide. And then if we can switch to the visualizer,
So lidded boxes were made from folding archival box board. The box lids are the same depth as the walls, which gives the large boxes extra strength. The boxes have a drop down side, which makes removing the objects easier. Inside the box, the objects are interleaved with archival board and glassine. The boards, which are larger than the object, act, objects act as supports on which the object can be lifted out of the box. These have rounded corners to prevent them catching on the box walls when they're lifted out. The glassine layer which covers the object is super smooth, helping protect the surface from abrasion. Another important reason to, for choosing this rehousing method is its suitability for the collection. These objects were teaching aids and their condition suggests they've been well used. Many of the objects have descriptive labels. Some are hot stamped with Thomas, Thomas Radford's initials. Many have ribbons, strings or wires with which they were used to hang the prints and drawings. Others have pinholes at the corners. To mount these objects in the type of mount that's normally associated with works of art would both alter the context of them and conceal these features. This rehousing method provides enough flexibility for almost all of the object types in the collection to be rehoused in a consistent way, keeping the whole collection together so that objects don't become disassociated from the collection as a whole, which is identified as a major risk to collections. Hand back over to Rebecca Thank you. to tell you about her research. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so as a researcher, when you hear that a collection needs conservation um, work, it can be bad news <laughs> because it means that the access, your access will be restricted. Um, but in this case, actually being able to look at the collection before and after conservation um, and to talk to Elaine and um, Janae about the process and thinking about its condition and, the, and its material aspects was really central to the research I did. There's actually very little written documentation about this collection of images, um, though we know that at one point in the 19th century, they did have a full catalog. Um, we don't have it anymore. Um, in, abs in the absence of any of this sort of textual and contextual information, the collection itself and its condition can tell part of its history. So can we swap back over to the embryo? <clears throat> so one of the things I noted about the collection, as Elaine has already mentioned, um, is how dirty it was. Fingerprints and pencil marks, but also just sort of general grime, um, which suggests to me, perhaps, that, um, that the collection was viewed in rooms, perhaps heated by coal fires or perhaps lit by gas or candles. Um, and as Elaine mentioned, uh, she kept the, uh, the filters. So perhaps maybe in the future, we'll be able to do some analysis on that. And Elaine has also described how she decided not to uh, mount these collection items like you would sort of fine art works on paper. And I think this was such a great decision for me as a researcher because these objects weren't carefully stored and revered like fine art. They were used as tools, often to total destruction. Having them loose but protected allows us to see these ragged edges, the reverses, the labels, as they would have been experienced at the time. It's not hiding their material history. And you can see here with this one, which is, you know, it's a relatively thin paper that's been painted on. And we can see the fragility and the ragged edges and the fold line down the middle. Clearly at one point it was folded in half um, uh, that has weakened the paper. So this image, this is a, um, a painted image from a series. Um, that shows how the egg is released and then the embryo is implanted in the uterus. Um, we can see that these images were done quickly and quite roughly on paper. Um, and they weren't mounted as some of the other objects in the collection were, which suggests to me that maybe Thomas Radford uh, made them himself. Um, we do know that he did draw, so it's entirely possible. Um, and perhaps they are enlarged copies of book illustrations that he's brought out of a textbook so that he can do, um, that he can lecture using the images to a large number of students. But these images are not, you know, that they haven't been maintained using mounts, um, but they're also not totally ephemeral. They were catalogued and they were kept uh, in a cabinet, um, which we know from the sticker. If I zoom right in, can we try and center yeah, on the yeah. sticker? Here we go, the magic of technology. 
So it says number two, cupboard four, not for circulation. So, you know, from, and there are lots of these little blue stickers around the collection that, that mention drawer numbers and cupboard numbers, um, you know, which tells us quite a lot about how they were stored, that there were purpose built cupboards with drawers for these images, which would, you know, sort of uh, tally with what we know about how works on paper were stored at the time. Um, it's the, this fact that so the, the collection were clearly used for teaching, but the fact that it was not for circulation, which means it couldn't be lent out for people to take away, is probably what saved them from being totally worn to pieces, the reason we still have them today. Um, so should we switch now to the, the object with the image of the fetus? So this next object that we're going to look at is uh, materially quite different. Yeah. It's more robust, so it's painted on a thicker card uh, and it has tape around the edges. Um, there are signs that uh, it was hung on the wall. Um, and if we look at the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, we can also see an inscription. Um, that tells us what this image is. It says that the image shows, quote, a plan to represent the convergence of action on the head of the child during labor. So that's what this um, handwritten uh, text in ink says. And then at the bottom, we see again, Dr. R, his hot stamp. And at the top, we've got some pinholes and some little ends of ragged string that were clearly used for hanging the work. Let me flip it back. So basically what this image um, is showing um, is how the pelvis, the shape of the pelvis works to align the head and the body of the fetus um, during labor so that it can be born. Um, I love this image. Um, I think it's so graphically interesting with these bold red lines showing this convergence of action, as Radford says. Um, and it's also rare in this collection in that if it is a copy of a book illustration, um, I don't know it, although maybe someone in the audience will be able to tell me. I have not seen this image before, which makes me think again, perhaps this is one of Radford's own inventions. Um, and I think the reason it's so striking and these sort of red lines have been used is because it's intended to be seen across the lecture theatre. Um, such images were often hung on the walls uh, in rolling displays that could be um, changed depending on the subject uh, being taught. Um, things like the strings and the pinholes, plus the fact that it is on board with taped edges, suggest this purpose. Um, could we switch to the PowerPoint? So while we have no photographs or drawings of the Manchester Midwifery School from this time, um, we know that such rolling displays of loose images were widely used in medical education. Go to the next slide. There you go. So um, here what we have is a watercolor from um, 1839. So this is totally contemporary with Rod Radford lecturing in Manchester. And this shows a medical school in London. Um, and it shows uh, on, on the back wall of the lecture theater, you see all kinds of images, uh, large um, images on paper or card that have been uh, placed on the wall um, as part of the, the sort of material display of the medical lecture. Um, and you also see the hanging skeleton, which is pretty much always uh, present in the medical lecture. Um, and as you know, as we've been talking about the ways in which these spaces were heated and lit, you can see the hanging lamp in the middle of the room as well. And then if you move to the next slide, this is a much later photograph from just early into the 20th century um, that sh uh, of a medical school uh, in America. But um, it's important to say that sort of cultures of medical education were really circulating between Europe and America at this time. Um, and this one shows, you know, the pr pretty similar practices being maintained, sort of large images on paper being um, selected and displayed on the back wall of the lecture theatre to illustrate a lecture. And interestingly, in this photograph, you can also see that the lecturer has a massive model of a skull at the front there and at the side that he's using as well. Um, and then can we move, if we go back to the visualizer and we look at the, the spine and pelvis. Yeah, perfect. So many of the items in this collection are in various states of wear, 
Some are reinforced and others not. Um, but the collection includes some works that were definitely meant to stand up to hard use, like this one was painted on board. Um, it's a, and it's an oil painting. Um, and if we can look at the reverse. Um, you can see at the top, actually, maybe we can zoom in a little bit on the top on these bits of tape. Um, <clears throat> you can see that there used to be bits of ribbon or tape attached to the top of the work um, to used for hanging. And now all we have left is the bits of paper that were placed that were sort of glued or um, adhered over the tape. Um, and it's since been ripped away. Um, but we can see probably this was done multiple times. We've got three different instances. Mm. And then if we flip it back again. Um, so this painting, I suspect, was probably uh, commissioned by Radford from a local artist, and we know he used Manchester's local artists to create these medical illustrations. And they were not always artists famed specifically for medical illustrations. We know at least one instance of a landscape painter who was producing things for Radford. Um, and I suspect it was meant for more permanent display. Um, we know from some of Radford's notes that are in the library's archive that paintings such as this one, uh, which show the pelvis um, and the spine in cases where the person has had sort of um, spinal and pelvic deformities, um, were permanently suspended in the lecture theatre um, and that the viewer could move from seeing uh, images such as this in the lecture theatre to the hospital's museum where casts of the same bones could be consulted in three dimensions. And the inscription on the reverse of this reads, first view of pelvis distorted from Moletti's osseum with spine all. So we know that it's, uh, it, it is meant to be showing these medical students um, uh, a spine and pelvis that has uh, deformities and how it's been, how it has grown. Um, and clearly, it, so we clearly we know from this inscription that it's one of a set describing, very, describing this condition in which the bones soften and then deform. Knowledge of the skeleton and diseases of the, um, the, that deformed the pelvis uh, were central to midwifery practice at this time, um, for obvious reasons. They were also of particular interest to Radford, who was a supporter of caesarean section, um, which was an extremely risky and dangerous procedure at this time um, because of the lack of anesthesia uh, and antiseptic practice. Although in certain cases where a, a baby literally couldn't be born naturally, it was also the only answer. Um, skeletons were often displayed in medical schools, as I've already said, as we saw in the watercolor of the Hunter School. Um, so it seems likely that paintings such as this one, which are showing skeletons and also the specific knowledge of obstetrics uh, would have been useful both for educating the students, but also for legitimizing uh, midwifery and obstetrics as a practice at the time, making it seem like one of the medical disciplines. Um, and then if we move back to the, our, our diseased uterus. <clears throat> so we're now gonna go from something large that I think was probably hung on permanent or semi-permanent display um, to something much smaller. And, you know, the, the, uh, the objects in this collection really range in size. Um, so this, as you can see, this small um, item has a ribbon at the top, a little pink ribbon, the, which means that it could have been hung on the wall and um, formed part of a rolling display as a part of a lecture. But I think it must also have been handled and looked up up close. Uh, and the fact that each of the illustrations from this book have been uh, mounted on board suggests that it was meant to stand up to that kind of handling. And also in order to sort of get the most out of these uh, illustrations, you do need to look at them up close. Um, the grime on these objects would certainly indicate that they were heavily handled. So this is a hand colored book illustration um, Radford, as part of his collecting practice, removed all the illustrations from Hooper's Morbid Anatomy of the Human Uterus, published in 1832, um, and mounted them all separately. And this is one of the illustrations, and we actually have pretty much all of them still in the collection. Many of these items uh, have stickers and labels. Sometimes they've become detached. And one of the things Elaine did um, is to conserve these ephemera uh, and make sure they didn't become detached or disassociated from their works. And you can see how important it is to keep these labels in the right place 
and particularly because it isn't always easy to reunite them once they've become disassociated. Um, the medical knowledge they contain is both very specialist um, and also very specific to the period. So uh, as someone trained in art history rather than medical science, uh, it would be hard for me necessarily to reunite them. And then even someone with contemporary medical knowledge today wouldn't necessarily have been able to read these images and their captions in the way that uh, an obstetrician from the mid 19th century would have done. So keeping these labels together with their objects is useful in the obvious way, helping to identify the image and to trace these histories of medical terminology and classification. But also I realized that they had an interesting material history. Um, these little labels, and you can see that this object has one that's attached with a very fine thread or thin string. They're written on the backs of uh, printed cards, cards that had printing already on them. So I, as I went through the collection, I started photographing the reverses of every label I came across that had printing on it um, and piecing together the fragments digitally. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, um, you'll see what I discovered when I had enough photographs to piece them together. There we go. So here's my photographs that I've pieced together of all these different labels. And you can see um, that what we're looking at are, um, were originally admission tickets to the Manchester Medical Institution, um, which is better known now by historians as the Mount Street School, uh, which closed down in 1834. We know that Radford lectured there in the 1820s. Um, so he clearly repurposed the defunct lecture tickets once the school was closed to label his illustrations as he was collecting them in the 1830s. So there we have it. These are the four objects that we've been that we've used so far to um, give you a sense of the Radford collection and its material history. Um, I hope we've given you a sense of this collection and it's important for histories of medical education. Um, and I hope we've shown how material histories of conservation, material histories and conservation um, often go hand in hand and inform each other. Um, and we'd now love to take questions. Thank you both. That was absolutely amazing. Um, just absolutely fascinating material. Um, yeah, I just like to encourage people to put uh, questions in the chat. I have a few questions to start with, um, but um, I can see they're beginning to come in now. So um, first of all, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the, um, the kind of relationship between the, the medical lecturers and the people who are producing these teaching materials. So you mentioned mm -hmm. that Radford used local artists, um, but was there a kind of formal medical illustration unit? Um, you know, who, who made the casts? I mean, obviously mm. the hospitals aren't short of people who can make casts, but you know, who, who else is involved? Are the local yeah. artists involved? Yeah, that's a great question because it seems to us, it seems like the kind of thing that a medical school would bring in house. But actually at this time being a medical lecturer, it was, it was sort of like, like being freelance. Um, so developing your own personal collection of books and uh, images and objects uh, was really important to establishing your career and actually tr if you're trying to get a permanent appointment in a medical school or hospital if you can bring your museum to the hospital it makes you much more attractive uh, so lots of these uh, practitioners knew how to draw or train themselves how to draw um, or they would commission artists um, and often they knew or they would train themselves also to prepare specimens um, so it wouldn't have been done in House by St. Mary's or any of the schools that Radford worked for. It would have been his personal sort of investment in his career. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, we have got a question here in the chat um, from Kinjiro Amano, who asks, what materials and images are the current medical students using? And is there any influence of Radford's education method? So <laughs> you have a sense of how it's working now? It's a bit out of your period, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't study contemporary practice, unfortunately. Although I think, you know, the use of um, mm -hmm. uh, images and image displays, like, I, I mean, the fact that everyone now uses PowerPoint is pretty indicative of the fact that the use of images in medical lecturing is still uh, current, as is, you know, large libraries and medical museums. Um, but in terms of the knowledge uh, that would have been contained in the images in Radford's collection, you'd have to ask someone who can te who teaches midwifery today and uh, often when I give talks and I get to speak with uh, midwifery lectures today they often have very interesting insights about the, the differences and the similarities and I think both can be true something can be like totally the same then as now and it can be totally different yeah I mean it's it's such a 
it's such a kind of rich subject, isn't it? When you kind of you're bringing practitioners in to react to this material. Mm -hmm. um, I've, got, I've got a second question here. Um, I'll just say to people, I'll, I'm happy to read the questions out, but if you would like to ask yourself, if you can raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, so this message, uh, this question is from Kate Errington. And she says, I'm interested in the midwifery training you mentioned at the start of the seminar. What was the typical background of these women and was the training paid for? Yeah, um, I wish we knew more. Um, we know a little bit because we have so, sort of miraculously the attendance registers from the school that are still in the archive here. And this is an amazing resource that um, actually a lot more work could be done with it. Um, so we know the full names of many of the, both the professional midwives that were employed by the hospital and the students. Um, so a little bit of sort of biographical work might begin to tell you um, who these women were. But what we know in general is that uh, people, women training in midwifery by this point, by sort of towards the middle of the century, they tended to be uh, from working class backgrounds. You know, they weren't um, anyone of particularly high status. Um, some of them would have been funding their own education, paying the fees uh, to both to the midwife who was training them and to attend the lectures at the hospital. Um, but others of these women, we know that they, they actually lived somewhere more rural outside of Manchester and someone of higher status in their community and perhaps local gentry would sponsor them to travel to Manchester to lodge with a midwife um, and learn from the midwife in practice and to go to the lectures. And, and then that woman would return to her uh, community and serve her community as a midwife. Fantastic. Um, we've got a comment here from um, a, a student midwife at Manchester. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> Ashley Wilson, um, who says, I'm a student midwife at Manchester. There are similarities with these compared to the study lecture material uh, that mm -hmm. I guess she gets. Um, and, and she says that she would love more images in this style, um, it, it, though, as it's sometimes it's hard to picture anatomy and physiology off diagrams rather than artist paintings. And I think this is such an important point actually the, the fact that these are produced by artists that there's got this there's a certain kind of like representational quality that's more that's beyond the schematic yeah absolutely yeah um, the questions are coming in thick and fast so so it's picking up please please send more um an anonymous attendee has said are there any issues with accuracy with these images if they were created by artists rather than medical professionals yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the major questions that I'm always addressing in my work, you know, as I'm working on these intersections between medical histories and art histories. Um, in that, of course, um, the way an artist is going to look at a, a specimen uh, or a dissected corpse or a book illustration that they're copying, uh, the, the knowledge they have and the way they see as well as the way they then represent is totally different to the person who's commissioning the work, the person with the medical knowledge. Um, and there's a really important text um, for working on this stuff called Objectivity by Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison. Um, and they describe this thing they, called, they call four-eyed sight, um, which is this sort of this vision that comes from the collaboration of the commissioner with the medical knowledge and the artist with the skills to represent. Um, and often the production of these images would be a collaboration. You know, the artist would produce and then the, um, the anatomist or the medical lecturer would um, make comments and suggest adaptations or changes. Um, and these, sometimes these uh, relationships could be very fruitful. And that's where we get sort of uh, lots of the anatomical books that, um, uh, that are studied by art historians because they are sort of like very visually interesting and rich. Um, and also sometimes uh, they could be very sort of um, uh, vitriolic relationships with lots of uh, arguing and debate about whether or not something should look like this or like that. So I think, yeah, there's always these sort of questions about uh, accuracy, but then I think the crucial thing to remember that there's always going to be a question about accuracy and representation and knowledge with any image created by anyone at any time. Um, you know, an image in a, in a medical textbook today is, has no more direct relation to sort of bodily truth than an image made in the 19th century. Thank you. Um, so um, we've got some questions here that are around the kind of collections and the kind of the kind of the housing of these images. Um, so Megan has asked, would there have been any tension at the time between museums and medical schools over who housed these materials? Was there a pressure from historians to preserve teaching methods? Um, I, I would imagine not. <laughs> <laughs> historians Medi are. Yeah, <clears throat> not really. So because as I was saying, a lot of these collections were privately owned by medical practitioners. Um, and they did with them sort of what they wanted. And there was lots and lots of sharing around and circulating. And then, you know, when someone went out business or died and there would be an estate sale and other medical practitioners would buy up the productions. 
Um, and then most of the medical museums, um, oh, there's a very interesting history of medical museums in the 19th century. In the early in the century, they were often public. So they would be housed in a medical school, perhaps, or a hospital, but they'd be open to the public to come and view. But over the course of the 19th century, lots of people became very anxious about whether or not this material was suitable for a general public and particularly for uneducated audiences. And there were lots of particular anxieties around women seeing these images uh, or people who were not considered to be educated. Um, and gradually more and more of these collections um, became uh, very restricted in their access. All of the medical schools ones became basically only accessible to students and teachers and people with sort of letters of recommendation. And the ones that remain more public uh, could, could often face sort of lawsuits about uh, on obscenity charges that they were showing this stuff and charging the public to see medical imagery. Thank you. That actually ties in with another one of the questions that we've got from Kate Errington, who asked, are there examples of illustrations that were designed and used more for educational purposes for the general public rather than trading medical professionals? So is there a kind mm. of censored sort of, you know, the kind of the equivalent of the kind of fig leaf movement I don't know yeah. a fig leaf on a gynecological resource no <laughs> you sort of cover the whole thing wouldn't you um not in the Radford collection my my sense of the Radford collection is that it was intended really only for professional and educative use um but yeah some images were produced for public audiences and there was lots of um medical material published in the 19th century for public audiences and you can sort again, you can trace over the course of the century that the images in them become more censored um, of material that was felt to be unsuitable. Um, thank you. I mean, one of the questions that's, that's come up, somebody has, well, it's, it's more of a comment than a question, um, was that someone has seen um, historic wax models used in other countries for medical training. And this is something that I wanted to ask you about because one of my favorite collections in the world is the Wax Museum in Bologna University. Mm. Um, and I wondered, do we have any, did we have any kind of equivalent models here at Manchester? I mean, is that, that the kind of like the anatomical waxes? Is that a thing in this country? Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, medical moulages uh, were produced sort of all over Europe. Um, probably not by Radford. Um, I think he had a, he definitely had a collection of prepared skeletons and casts of skeletons. Um, but sort of obstetrics doesn't really lend itself so much to wax moulages which from my understanding is more often to do with um skin disease and external diseases because that's where you can effectively take a cast of the problem um, and then you can paint it up so it looks like a very sort of realistic or accurate copy of the original um, but certainly such collections would have existed uh, in britain um, but as i was saying with the same with the with the paper collections that they just very rarely survive because they're very expensive to keep um, and very expensive to conserve when they start to deteriorate. Um, and I've been, I've seen uh, the collection at the Hôpital Saint Louis in Paris, where um, you can see that there's been some times when it's just got way too hot in the display hall and some of them have started to sort of melt away. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of survival rate of these collections is very low. Mm. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. The ones that I saw in in Bologna, I guess there were there was a kind of um, obstetrics room, but it was it was done more as a kind of dissection presentation. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, who who makes the models? <laughs> you know, I'm coming. I'm I'm, I'm obsessed about the, the people who are making the casts and making the models. You know, is it yeah. in house crews? I mean, I I don't know if we have a, much of a tradition of wax statuary in this country outside of the medical. Um, no, and I think it's it's sort of very case by case in terms of what people did. Um, and so, uh, yeah, particularly with things like wax models or uh, in the history of midwifery and obstetrics, they also made things they sometimes called phantoms or sometimes called mannequins or machines that were sort of working models uh, of the body in labor. So you could practice delivering uh, an infant. And these are essentially sort of specialist crafts. So, um, you know, uh, collectors would go some lengths and pay quite a lot of money to get specialists. Um, to produce them and the Bologna collection is really uh, special in that case because they were highly skilled producers and, and were making uh, casts so that, that then circulated all over Europe. Yeah, and I, I mean, to me, they look so much like the kind of the, the, the art objects and the devotional objects of the time as well. That's mm -hmm. really kind of interesting yeah. kind of um, kind of veil. Yeah, there's a great objects. sort of parallel history with wax ex votos as well in, in, in particularly in Catholic churches. Yeah. 
So um, the, the questions are fantastic because they're just they're just kind of just picking up on what you've said. Um, but we've got um, a question here from Jessica Dandona, who says, I'm curious if all of these images are static or if there are any with moving parts or interactive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, also curious if any of the watercolors of specimens include information about the subject they were taken from, such as name, case history mm -hmm. and so on. So I don't think there are not many moving. There are the very large flap anatomies. Yes, but yeah. that we showed. That you, yes, in, the, in one of the slides mm -hmm. and the sprat book as well. The sprat book, yes. yes. So, uh, but these are well. So the very large anatomies that we showed and that Elaine showed in the slides. These are technically part of the Radford collection now, but they're much too late to have been collected by Radford himself. Um, so perhaps they came from the midwifery school at the same time. Um, Radford personal collection of images they're all static images um but yes among the book collections that also came it, like radford's library contain things like sprats obstetric tables which um contains lots of flaps i mean i think um this uh, i think sprats is obstetric tables is on display currently in the violence is that it is yes yes, yes. so i would encourage all of our local viewers to go along to the john Rylands on deansgate and actually have a look at one of these books which is, which is currently on display in the gallery um, Juliana's also um, told us that the best collection of wax models in the UK is at Guy's in London. Mm. So, um, so we can go and have a follow on visit to that. <laughs> um, so have we got any more questions? Yes, Megan's got another question here. Um, does the university own any of the collections like this from Radford's contemporaries or are any others known at other research institutions? And if so, will there be any opportunities for comparisons to be made between the teaching materials? Mm, that would be so interesting. I wish I had managed to sort of do more concerted work on this. I'm, I'm struggling actually to find equivalent collections to the Radford collection. Um, and I think just because they, they're so sort of vulnerable to loss and destruction. Um, but if anyone knows of any medical schools um, that still have their image collections, I would be very grateful to hear about them. Because I think, yeah, we can learn so much about medical education and the role of images from Radford's collection, but how much more could you learn if you had several that you could compare? And one thing that we do have is um, uh, catalogues and estate sale catalogues from um, various uh, physicians uh, and surgeons when they were selling their collections, which tell us what kinds of things they had. So I know that the kinds of things uh, Radford had and the sort of the combination of it being prints from books uh, and paintings and sketches, um, that that's all pretty standard for the collecting practices. Um, but yeah, in terms of actual extant collections, I don't know of any others. Wow, so this really is a very kind of unusual resource. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, as I say, if anyone knows of any others, I'd be very grateful to hear about it. There may be some hiding out. And as I say, you know, that, that this collection was in the library's holdings for a very long time before it was catalogued. So it, again, there's a sort of difference between collections that exist and collections that you can find. Yeah. Um, well, OK, if anybody knows of more, then I think we'll, we'll all welcome the suggestions. <laughs> and we've got a, a question here from Frank, who says, my son wants to know why the ticket was cut up. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of really kind of think back to kind of the material history. The yeah, yeah, like absolutely. It. Well, so by the time that Radford was labelling these illustrations, the ticket was for a school that didn't exist anymore. So it's no longer useful as a ticket. And, you know, this is a period when, um, you know, fine hard wearing card is a pretty valuable resource. So you're not going to throw it away. You're going to repurpose it as something else. And that's what he's done. Excellent. Um, so we've got another question here that um, was from Beth on the on the main chat. Um, she says, was it common practice in medicine for pictures to be removed from books for teaching purposes? Or did Dr. Radford start this off? Or was he having pictures copied from textbooks? That was a mixture. Um, I think it was, it was almost certainly very common practice. I think people, you know, didn't revere books in the same ways then as they do today you know if you if you were wealthy enough to afford an illustrated medical book which most people weren't um you know if you'd made it if you you know had enough work as a, as a physician or a surgeon to be buying books you considered them sort of your own property and you were going to use them whichever way was most useful to you um so yeah if, and uh, i think sort of like uh, removing the images from books so that they could be used as teaching resources was relatively common but yes also and we haven't i'm not sure if we've got any out today but another thing that Radford did was uh, commission um, enlarged paintings of book illustrations. Um, and the point of these obviously is so that you can teach a large room using an illustration that in the book is too small. But a lot of them also do things like add colour, which I think is really interesting. So, you know, uh, particularly in the early 19th century, colour printing 
uh, is in its early sort of stages and it's pretty expensive and not necessarily very accurate. But um, if you're going to make a copy in gouache or oil, why not add color, which makes it so much more readable? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, oh, there must be loads of these pictures just stashed away in cupboards in universities. Mm, across the maybe, world. maybe. <laughs> um, Hannah Barker's just made a point that um, just in terms of the kind of material traces of, of users, yeah. um, you know, we, is there any scope, do you think, about kind of using, you know, kind of analytical techniques to check for kind of fingerprints or, or traces of people? Um, I, I did wonder when um, Elaine was talking about the filter, whether it might be a bit of a biohazard. <laughs> yeah, Elaine should tell us about this. <laughs> it's, it's double bagged, it's safe and in our <laughs> chemical cupboard. <laughs> But, you know, is, is, do, you, do you think there is scope, for example, to look at, you know, to take traces of, of users and things like that? I don't know. I think it would be interested to look at what the constituent parts of the dirt are and what spores are there and what pollen is around, potentially, maybe um, fragments of fibres and things just would just be very interesting to. Yeah, I mean, just the marks of use on the, you know, the plates and things, you know, where people have turned the page in the same place. So I, I think, I think you know, there's, there's so much to kind of learn about the, the way in which people interact with them. Um, I don't know, have I missed any other questions? Have we got some more? We've got some more comments in the chat. Um, so Andy Rackley says that um, he believes there's some illustrations extant in the Middlesex Hospital collection held by UCLH archives. Doesn't think it's a complete collection. Uh -huh. but it's been in the cataloging process. Also, some pencil sketches by Molly Lenten in the Queen Victoria Hospital West Sussex Records Office. Oh, fabulous! And um, illustrations. Get a copy of the chat. Yeah, and illustrations at East Grinstead as well um, for the treatment of burns rather than midwifery. Yes. This actually kind of leads me to kind of one more of my question. If we, of my questions, I mean, I could have, I could ask another hour of questions uh -huh. um, about. The emergence of photography. Um, mm. Are there photographic collections um, around this that kind of when does when does that start coming in to mm. offset? Yeah, people? absolutely. Sort of with that, totally with the advent of photography, it, it was adopted by um, medical lecturers m m um, and physicians. Um, but there's a lot of debate about which is more effective. Um, so there are, yes, there are medical photographs from sort of very early days of photography, and obviously it becomes more and more uh, dominant over uh, illustrations. Um, and I think there's also in the collection, uh, in the medical museum here, there are some, what are they called with the is it stereoscope, but you get the two photographs and you have to look at them using the viewer, so you get sort of a sense of three dimensions. Um, but there are all kinds of problems with photography as well, because it doesn't, it's not sort of interpreting that what's being seen for you so you know a lot of early medical photography has this problem that it's actually not very readable for students um, and the advantage of having an, a medical artist sort of recalibrate the knowledge for you as it becomes more readable mm -hmm. um, but yeah Radford didn't have any photographs in his he was collecting far too early for that really yeah. no it's, it's fascinating and we've got a question for Elaine in the chat um, was there any colour conservation for these images or was it just paper and structural repair? It was just paper and structural repair. It would be lovely to analyse some of the pigments and mm. find out exactly what media we have, but we didn't have time, unfortunately. So it was, it was really just making the collection accessible for Rebecca and making sure that there was no additional damage and no losses and that we could house it in a way that it could be retrieved from stores as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think um, I don't have, we've got one more comment from Kate that also that Newcastle University Medical Collection has got some plates that might be interesting mm. to reference. Um, but if there are no further questions, I think I'll just hand back to you. To, I think is there one further image that you wanted to share on the visualizer? Oh, well, we just thought people might be interested to see the rest of the stuff in this box. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about it? I mean, I think we've yeah, got, absolutely. got so four we have minutes. The, so. the visualizer up, we can definitely look at this in four minutes. So um, this is the box that has the uh, the image of the sort of the convergence of the action of the head. Um, and then here, we obviously a totally associated image here that we've got um, different views of a, a fetal head. Um, and it's these lines are clearly showing us um, different measurements. Um, and uh, the exact position of the head as the, as the fetus is born is like pretty crucial to whether or not it's gonna work or not. But, you know, it, 
just being head down is not enough for a smooth birth if the head because you can see it's so much wider in some directions than others and that's clearly what is being shown here as well as sort of different shapes uh, of the skull and you can also see that the artist is very carefully indicated and um, the plates of the skull because you know uh, the fetus the skull is not fused it's several plates that can move and shift over each other which allows them to pass through the narrow, narrow passage of the pelvis so and what's like wonderful about this and the, the other image that from this box is that they're clearly for midwifery instruction, not for, uh, for gynecological or obstetrical sort of medical education. I think these are you know, clearly like mainly aimed at the, these women students who are going to be practical midwives. And if we look at the next one as well. Oh yeah, this one is amazing. So this is a... Obviously, this is a male figure. Oh. Yeah. There we go. There he is. Um, <clears throat> and there, there is also a female figure in the collection. And actually, you saw just her feet in one of Elaine's slides. Um, she's not in this box, unfortunately. Um, and these are intriguing. I, I know of many examples of images like this, although I don't know if these exact ones come from a book. Um, but they're meant to show what they're intending to show you is the different sh shapes of the sort of standard male and female body, according to the sort of thinking of the time. Um, and I don't know if you're able to see it on the visualizer that there's a, there's a sort of faint gray oval that's drawn around the male figure. And then the female one, it's much more sort of wide in the middle to indicate the sort of width of the hips. Um, so, you know, these images are pretty sort of standard to medical education that you get a sort of ideal view of a, a healthy body. Um, and I also love that he's so Victorian with his little mutton chops. Um, you can totally tell when this image was made. So that's fine. Mm. The female figure had mouldy feet, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> and here, this one. This one is, um, uh, where is this from? I think this is from, um, I may be wrong, but my, my gut is telling me that it's actually a copy of a book illustration from a very large flat book by a man called James Hogburn, um, which was an, an obst another obstetrical flat book from around the 1820s or 1830s, um, sh showing all the different sort of positions of the fetus for birth. And what actually this one is showing you is um, that there's a sort of obstruction to the labor. Um, but it's sort of images like this are so common in midwifery illustration. Um, but again, so by, by, by reproducing them in paint you sort of you get, get gain this new facility for tone although not color in this instance well that's fantastic thank you so much mm. um so we're going to have to wrap up now but i really you know we'll have to do kind of like virtual applause but i'd like to thank our speakers for just giving us such an amazing presentation and thank all of you for coming and for your fantastic questions and i also want to thank the backroom teams in mission control who've made this run so smoothly literally a cast of thousands um 